Okay, welcome you all. Uh, this is Jessica Frank with Cali, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Today I'm going to be doing the A to J Author New User Webinar on repeat loops. Just a reminder, you all are on mute. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Otherwise, you can put your comments and questions in the chat box and I will try to get to those as we're going along. This webinar is being recorded. It's going to be posted on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash A to J author. You can also download the slide deck I'm going to be going through by clicking on the handouts link in your GoToMeeting control panel. You can actually download the last uh, two new user webinars as well on functions and macros and on question design from last month. So the first thing I'm actually going to start off with is um, authors I've been talking to over the last couple of months have given me or have looked for some tips on authoring. So I'm going to try to add those kind of tips into the beginning of the new user webinars, things that come up over the month that I've um, answered in emails that might be useful for the larger community. So I've had some questions about how to reuse interview components um, between different uh, interviews. So some organizations see an interview that another state has done and want to start with that as a beginning point, or they want to copy screens from one of their own guided interviews and reuse them in a subsequent interview. So right now, A to J6 doesn't have the ability to easily copy from one interview to the next. You can't just take a question wholesale out of one interview and put it into another one. However, if you're starting with somebody else's interview or you're starting with one of your old interviews and you're going to add to it, you can always download a copy of your zipped file or just the .a to J file if you don't need any of the external files like the XML list or images, that kind of thing. You can re-upload it to your own account on a to jauthor.org, and then you can start with that and make any of the edits or changes that you need. Um, it won't create, a, it won't override your original guided interview. When you re-upload it, it creates a new interview with a new guide ID. So even if it has the same name as your old interview, the guide ID is a unique interview number um, that's in our database, so it doesn't override override um, and you can always start with an interview that way. You can also copy and paste from one interview or from a script that your subject matter expert has given you into your interview. However, words of caution, make sure you use Notepad++ or some other plain text editor to paste from. So never use Word. Word can throw in some crazy underlying um, characters in the formatting. And if you bring that into your interview, which is just an XML file, it can corrupt it. So make sure if you are copying, pasting, and you're, you have, say, a Word document you're starting from, copy it from Word into a plain text editor and then into A to J. And if you're working with a subject matter expert or you want this peer reviewed and the, uh, the person isn't familiar with the software, they don't have an A to J account, you can always download a copy of your interview, a full report, which shows everything in your interview, uh, question text, variable names, learn more is logic, literally everything that's in your interview is in the full report. The script, though, only has the text. So script would be used for if you were getting it translated. The full report shows the overall flow of the interview itself. Both of those come as um, you can download, download them and share them as Word documents or PDFs or Google Docs, anything like that, um, so that your subject matter expert or your, the person who's peer reviewing your interview or testing it for you can just see the text itself. Um, and it's also a way that you can do um, a final spell check. Um, the full report has the Flash Kincaid score and some other uh, grading tools in it from Right Clearly. So um, it gives you some tips or hints about um, where your language falls in terms of grade level. So you can also work on making um, uh, the plain language better. So those are just a couple of tips that have come up in about the last month. So I will try to include things like this in each of our new user webinars um, as they come up. So first off, what is a repeat loop? Um, a repeat loop can also be called a repeat dialog. In Hot Docs, the questions are called dialogues. So those kind of two words, a loop or dialogue, are interchangeable. It is a series of questions that will display to your end user multiple times based on their input. 
you want to use a repeat loop if you have the same type of information that needs to be collected several times, and you don't want to have to create the questions uh, multiple times in your interview. So for example, um, the child's name, child's birth date, child's address, their father, uh, where they go to school, all that kind of information needs to be collected multiple times based on how many children the end user has, and so a repeat loop is a great way to do that. There are two ways in A to J Author to do repeat loops, and both have the same outcome, but they have a different front-end interaction with the end user. So the first way we're going to talk about is collecting the number of items or the number of people, the number of times the end user has to go through the loop first. You ask them up front for that number. The second way is to ask if there are any more items or people at the end of the question uh, series of loops. And when I get to each one of these, I'll talk about uh, the best case for where they use them. So the first way is collecting the number up front. You're going to use this when your end user is going to know right away how many times they need to go through the loop, and you ask for that number. So for example, the, the, um, the example I always use is when how many children somebody has. That theoretically should be a fairly easy question for somebody to answer. Um, they're not going to have to think about it or go through a list first to figure out if they have more children to add at the end. So you can ask them up front how many children they have, and right away uh, you, as the author, are telling the software how many times it has to go through the loop. Okay, so the first two steps, you create the set of questions that will, will repeat. So I like, as an author, to have a script or an outline going forward so I know what questions I have to ask before I actually dive into the software. So I know ahead of time that, um, for example, if I'm asking about children, I know that the form's going to ask for their name, their birth date, and their father's name, for example. So I, I create those three questions. So I um, create the variables that I'm going to need. So child name, first name, child last name, child middle name if you need it, uh, child date of birth, and uh, father, child father, uh, TE name. So I create those. I make the questions, three separate questions. And then I go back to the variables tab, and I create a counting variable. The counting variable is going to be a way for, for the software to track how many times the user has gone through a set of questions. It has to be a number on the variables tab, so it, uh, the type has to be number. We also uh, generally use a different naming convention than we do for, gen for um, other variables. One, because this variable is not going to be used in hot dogs. So um, it doesn't have to follow any kind of naming convention. Also, um, it lets me see right away that it is a counting variable, and it's not a variable that's used in question text to, that's not filled in by the end user. So I, uh, the, the naming convention I follow is, for example, here, child count. Both child and count are capitalized, no space, and no two-letter uh, indicator at the end to indicate the number, time, I, uh, the number type. I don't have NU after it, so just child count. Whatever you name it, it does have to be a number variable type. The third step is to create the first question in the, in the loop. This first question is a jumping off point. It's not going to be repeated to the end user. They're not going to have to answer how many children several times. So they only need to answer it once. It's a jumping off point. So on this how many question, you on step four, um, at, at, the, at the destination, um, on, on the button section, under destination, so the destination question should be the first question that's actually going to be repeated. So you can see in this screenshot on the bottom right that it is two dash child's name. That's my very first question that will be repeated. Repeat options. By default, it says normal, but there is a little drop down menu. You're going to click on that and you're going to select set counting variable to one. And you're going to tell A to J what counting variable to use. So I start typing child count, it auto populates, um, and now A to J is set. When the end user clicks this button, the continue, after they say how many kids they have, they hit continue, A to J is going to set child count to one. So it knows that this is now, they're jumping into that first loop. Then step five on all the questions that are to be repeated. So um, actually in my example here, I have two questions that will be repeated. 
the child's name and the child's birth date. On both of those questions, under the text section, you can see here is right under help audio, there's a field called counting variable. It's usually left blank, but when you're doing repeat loops, you need to tell A to J that this question is part of the, a loop, and the loop it is part of is the loop tied to the counting variable child count. So you put the child count variable there, and on every question that is to be repeated. You can see in the map section that uh, in the yellow column here, how many children is a number pick variable, and it has no loop. So you can tell when something is part of a repeat loop because we have a little icon that looks like this circle arrow with the word loop. So that tells me that I have put child count in that counting variable field on child's name and child's birth date. The next type of uh, question, or the next type of repeat loops that we're going to talk about is that asking to add more at the end. So you can see that the loop is also on these two purple questions, 2-s at name and 3-any more. This is just a way to see quickly if uh, your question is part of a loop. This little loop symbol also shows up on the pages tab at the end of the question's name if it's part of a loop. Step six is on the very last question that's going to be repeated. So in my case, it's child's birth date. If you remember, I had one dash how many children, two dash child's name, and three dash birth date, child's birth date. On this last question, I'm going to tell A to J that when they click the button, the continue button, after they give me their kid's birth date, I want to increment counting variable and add the, variable, the counting variable child count. So I tell A to J that basically they've finished the loop once uh, and go ahead and mark that the loop is complete. I see that I have a question, so I'm going to check that real quick. Yes, there's a question from Steve about having, um, we still have to create variables, including counters, in the variables tab first, rather than while creating questions. Um, yes, we are. Uh, you still do have to create all of your variables from scratch. Um, in the variables tab if you're not uploading a hot docs component file to start with. Um, in A to J4, you are able to create variables on the fly. Um, that is a feature request that we are working on though. So that you'd be able to create variables in any field on the fly. Um, and we actually should have the, this ability fairly soon. We're working on it um, in conjunction with our A to J uh, document assembly tool. So we're building a module, a modal that will allow you to do that. Okay, so um, back to step six. Um, so we have incremented the counting loop. We've told A to J that the end user has finished the loop. Now we have to create some logic to test against, uh, to test child count against how many times they told us they needed to go through the loop, which is stored in the variable, in my example, number of children and you. So we create this condition that you can see in the screenshot at the bottom of the screen here. So if child count equals number of children, so they've gone through the loop the number of times they said they had to go through the loop, I want to send them to a question called one dash do you have any? So move them out of the loop into the next section. Otherwise, so if child count, they haven't gone through the number of times they said they needed to go through, send them back to that first question in that's to be repeated, which is two dash child's name. So if true, send them out of the loop. If false, take them back to the beginning question of the loop and let them go again, which will set the counter again each time after they hit the continue button. The second way of doing repeat loops, which is asking to add more at the end. You use this in the case when an end user is likely not to know how many times they have to go through the loop, and you ask them if they want to add another one at the end. So for example, many people don't know offhand how many assets over $100 they have, but if they start making a list, and I'll show you a way to remind people of what they've already told you, so if they start making a list, they may eventually be like, yes, okay, and this, and this, and this, and this, rather than asking them, you know, I have 3,000 things over $100 or 10 things over $100. You wouldn't know necessarily off the top of your head how many times you have to go through the loop. Same thing create as uh, the other way. Step one, create that set of questions you want repeated. So um, for this example, I have the name of the asset and how much it's worth is uh, the only question in my loop. 
Um, so then you also create a counting variable, just like the other way. This one is called asset count, it's also a number. Um, on the first question, which is the jumping off point, the do you have any, because you don't want to send somebody through a loop if they don't actually have any assets or any things to tell you about. So the first question has two paths, a yes and a no path. This is the do you have any question. If yes, go into the loop, which we'll talk about here on step three. If no, branch them out of the loop uh, to the next set of questions. So on that yes button, the destination is to dash asset name, which is my first question to be repeated in this loop. I'm going to set the counting variable to one again. I'm initializing the count, and the counting variable is asset count. On the no button, you would just branch them out to the next one. There's nothing uh, you would have to do. The destination is the next question, and the repeat options is normal, because they're not ever going to touch the loop. On all of the questions that you want repeated, you throw this counting variable into the counting variable field. You do not put it on that do you have any question. You can see again that the loop symbol is showing up on the map. Step five on the last question. So um, in my example, I have that do you have any question? That's number one. Two is asset name and it's going to asset value. It's a two part question there. It's a two field question. And the third question in my section here is, do you have any more to add? Do you have another? Um, this do you have another question is repeated to the end user. So it is the last question in your loop. Um, and it is uh, it will have that counting variable assigned to it. So it is part of the loop because it gets asked each time. On this one, there are again two paths. Yes takes them back through the loop. No takes them out of the loop. So on the yes button on this last question that's being repeated to the end user, the destination is that asset name, that second question, the first question in the loop. Um, we're going to increment the counting variable, and we're going to tell A to J which counting variable to increment, which is asset count. So again, this is telling the software the end user has been through the loop and has finished the loop. On the no button, you just branch them out. They're done. So you take them to whatever the next step or next section is, next question, um, and the repeat options are normal. And then you're done. There's no logic in the asking to add more section. Um, you just keep having the end user manually push themselves through the loop. So variables in general in a repeat dialog, in any question that's repeated, are treated exactly norm uh, the same. Um, they're set up the same way, child's name first, TE. The only difference, which I'll show you in A to J here, my sample, is on the variables tab. If it is to be repeated, you have to make sure that the variable is set to check if multiple values. Let me zoom in on that. This tells A to J to allow multiple values to be held by this variable. If you don't check this, every time the end user goes through a loop, they're going to override the answer before. So if it only if you don't have this checked, A to J only allows one answer. So each time it overrides an answer, the last answer. If this is checked, multiple values can be held by this variable, and A to J will start indexing them and separating them out. So that's the only difference with variables. That uh, asset count or child count, whatever your counting variable is, do not check this because it's a normal number. It does not need to hold multiple values. It only needs to hold the one value, um, whatever the count is. And the only difference on a question in general um, that is part of a repeat loop is that you have this repeating uh, counting variable in the question text section that you indicate that it's part of the loop. Sorry about that. I don't know why my screenshot's not working there. Let me just reset that real quick. kind of half there. Um, so what this was, sorry about that, this is a screenshot of um, the uh, variables in script window when it's open in preview, which I'll show you in author in a second. Um, it shows you that the um, variables are stored in an index. So child last name has Frank and Frank, one and two. First name, Allison and Madison. So um, A to J starts building an index the more times you go through the loop. So each variable is given um, uh, an index number. 
associated with where it falls in the list of uh, input values. Let me see if I can reset this one as well. It's always fun with a live uh, tech demo when it's not working. Um, so what I'll, I'll just show you in author itself. Um, and the way, so what I was going to show you is a way in which you can help your end user remember which part of the loop they're on or which asset or which child they're talking about or what they've already told you about. So for example, on this, do you have any more for the assets? I'm going to give them help. They might think, um, which ones have I already told you about? And I'm going to help them by pulling out all of the values they've told me about using a macro, which we talked about in our August 2017 webinar, how to do macros. But it's simple. All you have to say is, uh, all you as the author have to type in is, you've told me about your, and then use a macro to call out all of the values held in the variable asset name TE. This is particularly helpful on the um, asking to add more at the end because it reminds them what they've already told you about. Most people aren't going to have a pad of paper sitting next to them at the computer and they're not going to be jotting down what they've already told you about. So this gives them that information quickly. And A to J automatically adds a, a comma and the word and if there's more than one. Um, it starts building the list grammatically for you. The other way to use a macro in uh, repeat loops is to use the ordinal function. So for example, I am using a macro to call out the ordinal value held by child count, which you remember is a number. So what this will display to the end user the first time they're through the loop will say, what is the name of the first child? Next time they go through, what is the name of the second child? And so forth. Um, and then I use this macro to call out the child's name specifically in the next question. So the first question, they tell me the name of their child. And then in the next question, I say, what is that child's date of birth? So what is Allison or Benjamin's or Thomas's date of birth? And I do that with a macro, um, percent sign, percent sign, bracket, child's name first, TE, which is my variable, pound the counting variable close brackets, double percent signs. So what this tells A to J is call out the value of child for name first TE pound, because it's indexing those multiple values, whatever count they're currently on. So each time it will only call out the name of the child held by whatever iteration of the loop the end user is in, rather than with the asset one where I didn't have pound asset count, it calls out all the values. So this is a way to call out a specific value rather than all of the values held by a variable. Let's see if this one's working. Okay, so this is an example then, uh, what I was just talking about. Um, we'll run quickly through the sample interview I've created. If at any time you all would want this sample to check out in your own um, account and to play with, feel free to email me and I can um, drop it over to you. So this is just a quick sample exercise or a uh, sample interview that I created. Um, whenever I'm working an author, I like to keep this variables and script window open, but it doesn't have to be open. This is what it would look like if um, it was seen by an end user. Let me zoom a bit for you. Okay, so for example, if we just run through this, how many children? I have a list that only allows one through nine, two children, first name. Now what is Allison's date of birth? Now it's gone through the loop. If we open up the script, it tested logic to see if I've gone through the loop appropriate number of times. I haven't because child count, which I said was two, does not equal, or sorry, number of children, which I said was two, does not equal child count because I'd only gone through the count uh, once. And it's also incremented child count to two now, so that's why it's showing what is the name of the second child. Again, it's calling out a specific birth date. So now, if you notice the on line 20 here, 
it's green, it's true, because child count does equal number of children, and now it has moved me on to the do you have any question. So here is do you have any assets? Um, yes, I do have assets. Asset of a house. Do I have another to add? So which ones have I already told you about? You've told me about your house. If I say yes, I have another one. Car. What have, how many, or do you have any more? What have I told you about? I've told you about your my house and car. If I kept going, it would add a comma in and keep this and there. And it will continue to make the list for the end user. If I click no, it bounces me out to the end of the interview. So that's just a quick example to see how repeat loops act in person. My email is just jessica at cali.org, and I'm available if you need help on uh, some of your interviews. If you have specific interview questions, I can uh, usually help with those. Our next webinar is November 2nd at 11 uh, Central. Okay. So thank you all for attending, and I will see you in November. Thanks.